Hi, church family. It's good to be with you again. Our verse for last week was Romans 6, 14. Sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6, 14. What a promise. What a promise. And um, in a sense, that is a foundational post for us as a church. One of the messages that I believe is sadly lacking in Christendom today as I listen to a lot of preaching is this message of Jesus Christ wants us not just to be forgiven from our sins, but saved from them. Isn't our God powerful enough to not just deal with our past, but to deal with the fact that I still face the opportunity to sin every day. And God wants to set me free and can set me free. A true salvation is one that's not just limited to what I have done, but also includes the fact that I will continue to face temptations, to be impatient, to lust, to be angry, to use my tongue in an unchristlike way, to use my eyes in an unchristlike way. And through all of those circumstances, sin shall not be my master. And I say that, my dear brothers and sisters, as one for whom sin was my master for years. As a born-again Christian, sin controlled me. My past was forgiven. I knew Jesus Christ was going to take me to heaven, but the Lord opened my eyes through the truths we have heard in this room and, and elsewhere that Jesus Christ could completely set me free, not just from not going to hell, but from living on this earth as Jesus lived. And I pray that no matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what circumstance you're facing, you will hold on to this hope. You shall call his name Jesus because he will save you. He will save you from your sins. Yeah. Thank you, Ajay and Olu. I don't know if I've heard a clearer testimony and a clearer witness of what our vision as a church should be in all my years of being here than what you just heard from these two brothers. Very, very, very encouraging, very challenging. Um, I would like to show you a verse in Luke 21 to begin. I found that one of the easiest ways to be freed from self-pity when difficult things happen to us and uh, circumstances happen that are outside of our control, the natural tendency is to wallow in self-pity. One of the surest ways to be, and think of self-pity like, like quicksand. I've never been in quicksand, I don't know if any of you have, um, but what I've heard is that if you are ever stuck in quicksand, the more you fight, the more you'll just sink down. The more you thrash around, the deeper you'll sink. At least that's what I remember being told. Um, and I think of self-pity like quicksand. That the more you think of what others have done to you or God allowing circumstances to happen to you, the more you thrash around in that anxiety and worry, the deeper you'll sink in. Another example, perhaps, that will help you picture it. If you've ever got a wheel on your vehicle that's stuck in mud, and there comes a point where the more you spin, the more you're going to dig yourself deeper in a hole. You need to be rescued out. Self-pity can be like that. The more you allow your thoughts, self-centered thoughts, self-focused thoughts to spin, the deeper you'll get, and that can ultimately lead to discouragement and uh, despair. So, I found that one of the easiest ways to quickly be set free from self-pity is to look around at the world around us and to see what is the reality of circumstances that people around us in the world are experiencing. And if you complain about the food being too salty or not having enough flavor, 
All you have to do is to think about somebody who's just thankful to have one meal for the day. If you complain, if, you, if you're tempted to complain about or to think sadly about yourself because of things people have said to you or done to you or said about you, the easiest way to be set free from that is to pause and think about people in the world today who are actually being killed for the sake of the gospel. People who are widows today, not just because they feel like widows because their husband is slandered or, or anything else except that their husband was actually killed. Their husband didn't show up one day after work. Why? Because the authorities came and showed up at his work and says, we hear that you're a Christian. And he says, yes, I am. And they put him to death right there. This is going on in the world around us today. And will continue to go on. And will happen in this country as well. So, in the midst of all of this, how do we preserve our faith? How do we keep our heads right? And how do we continue to strengthen each other in our faith in the midst of difficult circumstances? That's why I want you to look at Luke 21, verse 28. In this passage, Jesus is telling his disciples and telling us as well that difficult times will come. There will be persecution and for the people of Israel, there was a, a, a specific event that happened around 70 AD when Jerusalem and the neighbor, neighboring areas in Israel were ravaged by a general, I believe his name was Titus, under the Roman Empire. And in the midst of this, Jesus says, in verse 25, there will be signs in sun and moon and stars. And I believe he was also prophetically speaking about the end times. And on the earth, dismay among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. And, th and this is physical um, circumstances, physical events where the seas and the waves are rising up in such a way that it will leave the Christians perplexed and the nations perplexed. Men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. See, we go through and have gone through circumstances in our earth where the, where the earth shakes, where circumstances and situations around us shake. But what about when the heavens themselves shake? We haven't seen that yet. Where the sun all of a sudden, I don't know if that looks like the sun itself starts to shake in the sky and the moon starts to shake and... There's all kinds of things happening in the heavenlies. What will that do for your faith, friend, child of God, when you see the heavens shaken, verse 26? And then 27, after that, the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things happen, when you see, if you were to, in your lifetime, see that final shaking as it were, or before that, if you see other smaller shakings in your life before that, what will you do? This is the verse I wanted us to see. Verse 28, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your hands because your redemption is drawing near. That's the, the essence of my message today. Straighten up, lift up your head. Straighten up, lift up your head. Because I found over the last few weeks a tendency for me to do this, just kind of slouch. <laughs> Physically, yes, but spiritually too, just kind of slouch. And I felt the Lord telling me clearly yesterday, sit up straight, Santosh. Because in the, heaven, there is, in the heavens, there is no slouching. If you get to heaven and you are actually in the presence of God, nobody would be sitting like this. Oh. <sighs> Lord, can you imagine that in the heavens? In the heavens, they're sitting up straight. In fact, they're standing. And they're basking in the glory of the God who is unchanging. And the reason we slouch when, you, when, you, when we lose our jobs, let's say, or when the doctor's prognosis is bad, is because our heads are down here on this earth. I'm looking at the medical report. I'm looking at the circumstances around me that seem hopeless. And when we lift up our heads... Like Jesus said, lift up your heads. All of a sudden, 
You notice when you lift your head up, it has a way of straightening your spine as well. You just kind of straighten up. Doctors will tell you, medical doctors will tell you that that's important for you to do that. See, I work uh, in front of my computer all day long because I work for a software company. So it's very easy as the day goes on to just kind of, <laughs> your, your spine just kind of curves. And that's the worst possible thing that you could do. Sit up straight. Get some back support if you need. And I want to tell you, our responsibility as elders, our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ is essentially this. Our mission as a church family is to do this. Let's provide each other some back support. If you find that you sit down and talk to a brother or sister at lunch and you see that they're kind of down, kind of discouraged, there's a sad look in their eye, come alongside them. Be a back support for them, as it were. My dad has one. I probably need one too pretty soon. He's a little elderly. So when he sits in a chair, we have one at home that we keep for him whenever he shows up. It's a, it's a back support. You can buy them at Bed Bath & Beyond. And uh, they're very useful. But what they do is they cause you to, you know, they put some pressure along your back so that you don't sink back. You sit up, upright like this. Because the chairs that you, you, you buy in the stores nowadays have a very, a, a tendency to get you to slouch. You know, the more comfortable the chair, the, the worse it is for your spine, actually. So get one of these if you need it physically, but get one of these if you need it spiritually, too. Find a brother along, who, will, who doesn't want to gossip, who doesn't want to speak evil, doesn't want to complain, but wants to be a back support for you. Something that causes you to straighten up and lift your head. In a time like this, it's very important for us to fight. And that's the word I want you to think about also. I'm going to talk, tell, tell you about three areas of fighting. And the reason that's important for us is because we can fight. There, there's this, first of all, recognize that there's two battles. Ephesians 6, I want, you to show, I want you to see this verse. It's very important for us to know that. We'll talk about three types of fight, three areas of fighting. But first of all, you must know your battlefield. You must know your battlefield. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it talks about our fight. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Our fight, our struggle, our wrestle. Those are different words used in different translations. Our fight is, first of all, not. He tells us what is not our battlefield. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. So if somebody comes to you and does something to you, if your boss yells at you or gives you a pink slip and says you're fired, or the doctor tells you that there's a cancer, a tumor in your body, your fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the tumor that they've discovered in you. It's not against the company that let go of you even though you put in all that time. It's not against the person that's slandering you or the person that you think has mistreated you. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. So that we must be absolutely done with. Never ever lift up a sword against anybody, any human being. That's a no, that's a one-way street. <laughs> it should actually be a no-way street. But even if it is, even if you sense that the, the fight is coming from somebody, even in your marriage, brothers and sisters, if the fight is coming from your spouse, make sure that it's not two-way. Now, hopefully and ideally, both are spirit-filled and there's no fight at all. But we will face circumstances on this earth where there is, there is a fight or somebody that wants to fight. You lay down your sword that says, no, I'm not going to fight there. That's not a battlefield I'm interested in. The reason that's important for us to understand is because we must see where our real battlefield is. If you take up your sword in this fleshly battlefield, the flesh and blood battlefield, you will be so preoccupied with fighting those battles that you will lose the battle here. So it's kind of like this. The devil says, let me see if I can get them to be taken up with a fight here. And then I, the devil who really has power, he can come around the backside and take advantage of me because I'm not ready for him. That's what this verse is saying. So, let's read it that way again. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, and I would word it this way, so that, it, le it reads literally, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers and the world's forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
But let me read it this way, which is, I believe, the, the spirit of this verse. That's why that word but is there. It's a hinge verse, a hinge word. Our fight is not against flesh and blood so that we can fight against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we don't want to fight against our spouses, against our um, our relatives or others, anybody on this earth, we don't fight against anybody at all so that we can focus our energy and our battle against the spiritual forces of darkness. Keep that in mind. Anytime you find that somebody instigated by the devil tries to draw you into a fight, and by fight, you know, I know we're not going to pick up our fists and our real guns. It's usually words, right? Words are the most common weapon of warfare against flesh and blood. But the moment you find that somebody wants to come at you with that weapon of words, lay down that fight. Say, no, this is not a battlefield for me. And if they want to continue to do it, walk away. And say, fight, go in prayer and determine to fight that battlefield that God wants you to win. You may not even win one war on this earth. But the one war that God wants you to win is the war in the heavenly places and to recognize that there are spiritual forces of darkness at work on this earth. And God has given you authority. God has given us authority, brothers and sisters, because we're a part of His church against which the gates of hell will not prevail. We have authority and that's a battlefield battle we're sure to win. So think about that. So the three areas of fight, now that we know our battlefield, Fight for this. First of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Fight for your personal devotion to Jesus. Fight for your personal devotion to Jesus. If you lose that, it, everything else is gone. That's the trump card. Fight for your personal devotion to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11. We'll read verses 2 through 4. I am jealous. See, jealous is a fighting word. When a man is jealous over his wife because she think, he thinks his, her affections may be drawn somewhere else. Or better, a better example is when a man is jealous over his girlfriend because he's not yet married. I mean, a, a woman should never entertain thoughts about another man while she's married. But let's say a, a man and a woman are courting, they're dating, and they want to get married, and this man sees that somebody else is coming in and trying to woo her attention and grab her attention with his gifts. There's a jealousy that will come up. And this is the jealousy, so it's a fighting word. There is, in, in, in any man who really loves his, uh, his fiance or his girlfriend, there is a natural fight that will come up when he senses that somebody could take the object of his affection away. And that is that fighting word that Paul uses here. He says, I am jealous for you, church, the bride of Christ, and the church in Corinth as an expression of that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I am fighting for you with a godly fight, if you will. Because I betrothed you to one husband. I betrothed you to one man, Jesus Christ. I engaged you to him. I led you to him. So that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Now Paul, is and Paul had an apostleship ministry towards this church, the church in Corinth. And he says, listen, I was used instrumentally by God in your life. Not to betroth you to myself, but to betroth you to Jesus and to encourage that and to strengthen that. And he says, now I'm worried that another man is coming in or another suitor, another message is coming in that it will sway you. That's what he goes on to say. I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, by subtlety of words and and uh, craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus. 
So fight for this, dear brothers and sisters. Fight for this in your marriage. Fight for this in your home. Fight for this in this church. Fight for this when you encounter and interact with other brothers and sisters who are part of Christ's body. Fight for that. Encourage and stir up that purity and simplicity of devotion to Jesus. Because, verse 4, people will come who preach another Jesus. See, we hear this often as well. We want to be just devoted to Jesus. We want to be just devoted to Jesus. It's possible for the devil to mislead us into a devotion to Jesus that is another Jesus. You see what Paul is saying here? He's saying, I betrothed you to one Jesus, the true Jesus, as we see manifest under the new covenant. But others will come and use the word Jesus. It's not another God. It's not another religion. It's another Jesus. Using the same word Jesus, but looking different. And Paul says, I betrothed you. The things I shared with you and spoke to you for all these years were to betroth you to Jesus and to keep you attached to him. Make sure that that devotion to him stays pure. So this is the first area of fighting in the spirituals, in the spiritual realm. Fight for your devotion to Jesus. How do you do that? How do we do that practically? In our thought life, as you go about during the day, the devil will bring all kinds of thoughts. You will look around the world around you and all kinds of thoughts will come in. Fight in that area of your thought life for devotion to Jesus. Clear, um, clear your ears of all the other things that will try to come in. Clear your vision of all the other things that will try to come in and block out who Jesus is. And so fight to preserve that devotion for Jesus. Fight to hear His voice alone during the day. Do you know that He wants to speak to you during the day? Fight. If you're sitting there doing dishes, if you're sitting there changing a diaper, if you're sitting there doing your work, if you're driving in the car, fight in your thought life to preserve that devotion to Jesus. Tell the Lord, Lord, You are everything to me. You will always be everything to me. I don't want to be drawn away by anything else. I want You to be foremost. I want You to be preeminent in my life. Fight. Fight it, fight it, fight it. If you're not fighting it, the devil is fighting it, and he'll win. So fight to preserve your personal devotion to Jesus. Secondly, fight for a deeper foundation of love. Fight for a deeper foundation of love. If you found that in a circumstance in your marriage, let's say, some shaking happened, and there's the spirit of divorce comes in, let's say, where something is challenging your marriage and you some questions about your spouse or questions about your children uh, when that comes in and a little bit of shaking comes in what should your response be the response of the world is oh, I'm just gonna run away I'm not it's not worth fighting but the response of the true Christian ought to be this if the foundation wasn't deep enough that this house could be shaken it doesn't mean that we just destroy the house it means that our foundation ought to be deeper so in your marriage if you found that all of a sudden these thoughts are starting to come in about your spouse he says ah she's like this or he's like that the solution is not to just run away the solution is to say Lord I want to go deeper in love this is what we've preached here from the very beginning at least the 10 years that I've been here let's go deeper and deeper and deeper in love so that no storm no uh, uh, tornado can come and uproot us from that love. And so as we go through even the circumstances in our church, what should we do? Go deeper in love. Dig deeper. It doesn't mean that we uproot and say, let's, let's just tear everything up. No, I want to go deeper in love with you, my dear brothers and sisters. That's the desire of my heart. And in order to do that, there must be the mentality of standing in the gap. Sometime, I don't have time to show it to you. Read Ezekiel chapter 22. It's a very significant passage. And specifically, where he gets towards the end of that chapter in Ezekiel 22, he says in verse 30, I look, fight. You wrestle against the principalities and powers by the authority of God in prayer. You may not be able to convince the person uh, with whom that gap is coming. You may not be able to convince them with words. Lay down the weapons of your words and fight in prayer. Fight in prayer and believe that God has given you the opportunity to fill that gap through prayer. 
That's true in the home. That's true in the church as well. If you find a gap coming between you and your brother or your sister in the church, what should you do? Rather than allowing that you know, suspicion to grow and stepping back from that relationship and just kind of waiting and seeing, that's a non-fighting mentality. You must fight. If you find that there's a gap, if there's a suspicion, if there's a doubt, if there's an uncertainty, if there's, if there's something that's not the love of Christ between you and one other person where God has knit you together, fight to fill that gap. Fight to fill that gap. You be the one that stands in that gap. That is true love. Um, I want to read for you, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13, you know this chapter. This chapter, I, I've been going back and reading it again and again and again in the context of the church. What does true love mean? Because what we have preached here from the very beginning and what we will continue to preach is a love that endures, a love that stays, a love that seeks the best of others, a love that doesn't just see a situation and run away in fear or in uncertainty, a love that's willing to take risks and say, I will. And this, these verses have really come powerfully to me in the, in, the last, in the last few weeks. And the Lord's working it in my heart. I, I can't say that I fully understood how it's going to work out. But it's the Word of God. And it's true. And I, uh, you know, it's interesting that you hear this often preached in, in marriages. And that's true. That's a good place to, to begin. But I think it's good for us to consider that in the context of us as a church. But I, I'm not going to read it because you know these verses well. But verses 4 through 8 Here's a paraphrase of it from the message paraphrase, which really helped me understand the kind of love I want to have towards every single one of you if you will allow me to love you this way. Um, in another passage in Romans 12, I think he says, let love be without hypocrisy. In 1 John 2, he says, or verse, uh, chapter 4 actually, 1 John 4, he says, let us not just love in, in deed, I mean in word, but in deed. Let that love not be just saying, oh, I love you guys so much, you're stuck with me, but let it be proven in how I live out my life, in the choices I make. So 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 reads like this in the, in the message paraphrase. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sin of others, or the sins of others, doesn't revel that means rejoice. It's a, the, the literal is doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. Doesn't revel when others grovel. When you see others groveling in, in how they speak or how they act, doesn't rejoice in it. Doesn't see others falling into sin and rejoice in it. Says, ah, see, I told you so. Doesn't revel when others grovel. But takes pleasure in the flowering of truth takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end, love never dies. Oh, what wonderful words. And I believe, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to read it again, just in case you missed it, but if, you, if not, these aren't my words. They're Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, you can read it, find the message uh, paraphrase and you can read it yourself and ask the Lord to speak His truth from what He has actually written. Maybe He'll use the paraphrase to bring it to light, but allow Him to speak it to your heart. But I, I believe if you're willing to look for circumstances and for opportunities to love this way, with the love of God, it won't be, a, it will take more than just a natural work. It's going to take something supernatural. You will have to come to a place in your life where you say, Lord, I absolutely cannot love this person that way. I can't. 
I just don't have the way. I, I can't love my husband that way. I can't love my wife that way. The standard you're setting me for love is just too much. And you will find that the spirit of the world is just say, it's too much. I'm going to find somebody else whom I can love in a natural way. Instead, dear brother, dear sister, God is calling you to love beyond your means. To love beyond your ability. To love in a way that requires the supernatural power of God. Where as much as it feels like the, the easiest option is to just drop it and run, you will be forced. Paul uses the word compelled, constrained. He'll say, I don't have any option but to love. Because the love of Christ constrains me. The love of Christ compels me to love. This is the attitude Paul had towards the world, towards the churches that God gave him responsibility for. And this is the responsibility I believe God is laying before us. Where you say, you know what? I don't want to, but I have to. Not because some man is telling me to, not because I'm afraid of God, but because the love of Christ has so flooded my heart and it's shed abroad within me that I don't have an option. There is a power that is driving me that's beyond my own ability that leads me to love. That leads me to stay and invest and to plant and to nurture. Do this for your marriage, dear friends. Do this for this church. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best in others, never looks back, but keeps going to the end, keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Fight for a deeper foundation of love. Dig deeper. If, if, if the building shook, dig deeper. That's all you got to do. Dig deeper. So fight for your personal devotion to Jesus. Fight for a deeper foundation of love. Love that will not ever tear apart. And thirdly, fight for the territory around you. Fight for the territory around us. Um, Joshua 13, I want to show you this verse. Joshua chapter 13, verse 1. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old <laughs> and advanced in years. I love that. Joshua was old. You know, the, the, the narrator is telling us that Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord had to tell him, you're old and advanced in years. Why is that significant? Joshua didn't know it. Joshua didn't know that he was old and advanced. I mean, I'm sure Joshua knew how old he was. We're not talking about that. Joshua, maybe he was 95. Or he died when he was 110, if I remember right. So maybe he's 105 right now. And he, he knows his age. But he doesn't know that in his spirit, he's old and advanced in years. And the Lord spoke this to me very, very clearly. I think one of, somebody shared it a few weeks ago, and, he, and that verse has been coming back to me. Santosh, are you old and advanced in years? Yeah, I'm only in my 40s, but spiritually, have you, have you become as a church old and advanced in years? Like, God, oh, we've been a church for so many years. We've become old. And maybe we didn't realize it. And the Lord had to say, you're old and advanced in years. I can't use you. The passion and that desire for love is gone. And look at the re this latter part of the verse is the one I wanted to show you. Very much of the land remains to be possessed. When God called jo Joshua when he was young and not advanced in years, he said, the whole land is for you, Joshua. And they got some of the land. God, they accomplished some of what God intended for them to do in their lives, but not all of it. Why? Because they were old. They became old and advanced in years. 
Let's fight against that spirit, dear brothers and sisters. The spirit of aging spiritually. The spirit that slows down and says, oh, look who we are, what we have done, what we have become. And I pray that the Lord will continue to shake us so that that spirit of being old and advanced in years is shaken out of us because it is not a good foundation. The spirit of Jesus says in John 13 verse 1, loves to the end. I've used this picture. When, I, when the Lord calls me home, I don't want to die shifting into neutral. <laughs> I want to die shifting into eighth gear if there is. I don't know if they make cars with eight gears, but if they do, maybe they do. I want pedal to the metal, speedometer on its way up, right into the presence of God. Not, I'm in my retirement sunset years. And my dear brothers and sisters, it has nothing to do with how old you are. It's not a physical aging and advancing in years that... Maybe it was for Joshua. But what, what God was saying is it has nothing to do with your age, Joshua. It has to do with the fact that you haven't finished the work for which I placed you on this earth. I'm going to take a sip of water. That's how I want to die. <laughs> There's nothing left. See, there was quite a bit of water left and I had to gulp it down. But um, this, this isn't us yet. There's still some of us left that God wants to pour out. And we can say, well, Lord, you've done so much through us. You've helped us. And we don't see, because we're looking at what has come out of this cup. How God has blessed others through us, perhaps. I invite you, and I believe the Holy Spirit's inviting us to look in and see there's, there's some left. And that some that needs to be poured out yet is not limited by the number of people available to do it. That's the thing. God says, will you pour yourself out for my church, for the people around me? And the word specifically, the Lord has spoken to me, is this community that we live on, around. Yeah, a lot of, many of us have come here from other places, moved here, myself included, because I sense the Lord was calling us here. But I believe the time has come for us to look at the communities around us, our neighbors, the people around this very building, but the neighbors that you live around. We hear often about, I've, we've spoken often in this church about gossiping and not gossiping. I want to encourage you to gossip. Gossip the gospel. <laughs> Have a, a tongue that is just itching to tell somebody about what God is doing in your life and the hope that is within you of what God wants to do in your life and bring them here, brothers and sisters, so that we can all gossip the gospel together fight let's not sit back let's not take the armchair approach and just say well whatever happens will happen Ki sera, sera, like they say let's fight fight for your personal devotion to Jesus fight for a deeper devotion foundation of love and fight for the territory around us and I don't just mean this physical building and the neighbors around us but the territory around us as represented by each of you families <coughs> Each of you lives in a locality that God wants you to fight over. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for them. Pray that God will give you an opportunity to speak to them, to bear witness to them, to give an account and a defense of the hope that is within you. And if you really mean it when you pray, He will. That neighbor's kids will, kick, will, will hit the ball over into your yard and maybe break a window. And instead of being frustrated over the broken window, he says, Lord, you answered my prayer. That boy's going to have to come over with his dad and apologize for breaking my window. And let me tell them about the God that is in heaven. We have tracks in the back. We have some books in the back that, will, that if you're a, a, a shy or you lack boldness on how to reach your neighbors for the kingdom, pick up a few of those. They're only 50 cents each or something like that. Um, and use, be, be vigilant. Take up the battle and God will use you. Amen.